I want to uh, do this, obviously, uh, understanding uh, basics of uh, connected and automated vehicles. And then these are some key technologies. And then uh, there are uh, many applications that uh, US DOT, when they started uh, connected vehicles, uh, want to uh, introduce those technologies. And hopefully, you'll uh, be able to use this technology later in the research and hopefully uh, for your business as well. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. So the first uh, topic is uh, uh, overview. I'll start with the video. I'm not sure this will have audio with it. Maybe no audio. So this is a, a cooperative adaptive cruise control demo uh, done by U.S. Uh, Federal Highway Administration. And they actually used the uh, abandoned uh, airport area. And these guys are talking about how important this is and how this can be used for improving urban mobility and, and so forth. Uh, one of the challenges of having this CACC is uh, properly uh, identifying which vehicle to which. And at this point, uh, there's a no way to know exactly which vehicle is which vehicle. In other words, when they do this demo, they uh, have a hard-coded vehicle ID. So whichever vehicle is the number one, it sends a message with I am number one vehicle. They can immediately know this is coming from leader vehicle. Uh, in, in reality, uh, this is a way of doing the joining and, and, and merging, and this is another challenging uh, task of CACC as well. Uh, if you think about real world, and with the GPS errors that we have, it could be a few meters away, and since a privacy issue, we cannot really tell I am license number something. I cannot tell Brian Park and things like that. So what's going to happen is that they will send the message as a leader vehicle and follow my message if you are <coughs> following vehicle. And there's a huge confusion because you don't know which one's which. That's one big challenge in this area. And also right now, these vehicles, they look different colors. They're all same Cadillac uh, vehicle. Uh, so they uh, have the same vehicle dynamics. In real world, there might be different vehicle types. Uh, Suzuki's and Hyundai's and Ford is not very popular here, but uh, other vehicles. So we need to figure out how to coordinate those as well. So that's another big challenge in this. Uh, I have to skip this one. Uh, maybe I can, is there a way we can get the audio? So this is a, a connected vehicle pilot test. Uh, you can probably watch it later. We, you'll get the video uh, slides anyway. So the pilot test is uh, basically uh, demonstrate the usage of a connected vehicle. And uh, it's a limited uh, test. So USDOT actually awarded the three different locations. This is in New York, uh, and also Tampa, Florida, and also out of nowhere, Wyoming somewhere, and then doing the pilot test of having benefits. And connected vehicle, one huge advantage is that when you have a no uh, line of sight, and this technology can provide by communications, and with the help of infrastructure, and tell that when there's a two vehicles might be colliding each other, and they don't have a line of sight, then they can actually rely on this V2B technology, v 2 i technology to, to avoid those uh, collisions. And they can actually do even better, they can do cooperatively control to avoid a collision. If you have no two-way communications, you keep telling them, I'm coming, I'm coming, get away from me, and depends on he or she apply, complies with it. Uh, with the two-way communication having this, uh, they can actually negotiate. Hey, I need to go first. Uh, they could even uh, do the bidding process. I pay you something and then do, do something. Uh, so that's how we have a potential of advantage that connected vehicle will provide. Obviously, there's many, many challenges, but provide ways of uh, uh, cooperatively controlling uh, vehicles and then vehicle infrastructures. So this is going to be huge new uh, opportunities. 
Uh, another interesting thing is that connected vehicle will disseminate their uh, speed and acceleration location information every 100 milliseconds. So this data is uh, just abundant amount of data. We never uh, ever tried to collect and manage. So there's a, I'll probably explain later, but uh, more challenges on how to do the data management, not a way of uh, collecting them. Uh, collecting them is one thing, and how do we process them such that we only keep what we need. And, and challenges obviously depend on applications. Some don't need many data points, like uh, providing route guidance systems. I need to have a link of travel time, and you don't meet, need many data points. <coughs> But if you want to do uh, a very detailed collision avoidance systems at the intersection, you probably want to have even shorter than 100 millisecond uh, updates of the intervals. So how do we manage and how to use is going to be very important research in the future. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about a little bit of history on automated vehicles. Whenever we ask about driverless car or automated vehicles, everybody goes, Google is a driverless car. It's probably the first one. Uh, maybe it's the first one actually publicly well recognized. Uh, as you can see here, even 1980s, DARPA is uh, uh, an agency part of the uh, Department of Defense in the US uh, doing the high advanced research for uh, improving the capability of uh, defense uh, uh, war games and things like that. So they wanted to try out this uh, autonomous vehicle, and they did it, and then they were able to do about 19 miles per hour, which is a pretty good. Uh, and then 1995, uh, CMU is a Carnegie Mellon University. They wanted to have a challenge of uh, crossing entire continent, uh, about 3,100 miles across the uh, U.S. coast to coast. And here they actually did about 98.2% of the time fully uh, autonomous way. What it did was it's uh, doing steering wheel uh, maneuvers. And remotely, uh, a person was uh, doing the acceleration and deceleration. They were not able to do that far, but basically showing that with the cameras and, and technologies, trying to follow the vehicle ahead of it. So that's uh, some, some uh, potential of doing that. Uh, in 2000, so this is an interesting uh, development. Uh, in part because of the uh, Congress mandate. So Congress makes law and then uh, uh, executive branch actually follows that law. And, and then in 2000, they actually made that there got to be a military purpose. Uh, autonomous amend the vehicle by 2015. Uh, so this was a challenge. And to accomplish this, DARPA uh, uh, announced a grand challenge. Uh, we'll have uh, anyone actually can allow unmanned vehicle or autonomous vehicle getting through the uh, certain area of the uh, uh, competition and they'll give uh, like a two million dollars awards. So in 2004, it didn't do very well. Uh, most of the car made it about only 7.32 miles. Uh, and then second, they did a lot better. A uh, huge change happened on third challenge in 2007. And Back, uh, it, back then, the car from Carnegie Mellon, uh, called the Boss, actually made it through the entire course. And this one actually had uh, something about uh, there's a, a stopped vehicle, and Carl has to recognize that it's a stopped vehicle, and if needed, uh, moving backward a little bit and then weave through that vehicle. So this was a truly uh, not real world level uh, autonomous vehicle, but uh, fully functional autonomous vehicle level. I highlight uh, Chris Omson. Uh, anyone know who he is? So obviously Chris Omson is the leader of this uh, uh, Grand Challenge team, boss. Uh, he was a faculty at Carnegie Mellon, and he was uh, recruited by Google secretly. Google did not announce publicly. Uh, Google actually gave him a uh, division of this uh, driverless car that Chris Thompson spends almost an unlimited amount of, amount, amount of dollars for making Google the driverless car. Obviously, obviously start from their uh, boss vehicle, but they made this happen. And that's how the Google the driverless car started it. Uh, this is a sort of a sensors and 
so called the bells and whistles of uh, Google's car. And the most important sensor is uh, something called the LiDAR. Uh, this is uh, looking at the 360 degrees. And uh, I don't want to call the company name, but the company actually sells this at about twice as the price of the car. So uh, it's not really good for general public adoptions, but it's uh, great for uh, some company like uh, Google and putting this and, and they actually drive these uh, many, many places. They actually drove over 8 million vehicle miles since they got the Google's car, which is a very, very long, long distance. Uh, so they actually have a technology that actually continuously improved over 8 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, so this is what uh, LiDAR is seeing. Uh, it recognizes everything. And they have a 64 uh, channels. I have a company name, unfortunately. Uh, So-called VeloLine is the leader. Obviously, they developed this for military purpose and then came down to uh, uh, general uh, uh, civilian uses as well. Uh, good news is that this is getting cheaper. Uh, VeloLine is not the only company providing LiDAR. And a lot of other companies are creating uh, innovative way of uh, uh, making a uh, lower price on these and hopefully we'll have a uh, affordable price for regular vehicles. Uh, if you know about car industry, they are really trying to save even dollar in their manufacturing uh, uh, because the uh, cost of the uh, car, car has about 22,000 parts. So getting those from the suppliers and putting together and then they have to give money to sell the the dealer shops and, and they're not making a lot of money, at least in the U.S. They only make a lot of money by selling the big the trucks, like a Ford big trucks. Uh, they don't make a lot of money for uh, passenger cars. Uh, so that's how their margin uh, is uh, structured. So uh, putting this is not going to be cheap. Uh, that's why a lot of the high-end vehicles are afford to have uh, uh, lane departure warnings and, and, and those things. Uh, so that's that. Uh, just one thing I can mention about the technology uh, uh, development is that Google's, uh, this LiDAR can recognize uh, when a person is about to come into the crosswalk and they can see how fast they are uh, moving. Uh, some people actually uh, move and slow down, try to stop. Some people continue to accelerate to move. So they recognize those uh, subtle change and then that guy will stop, that guy will continue to move, I'm going to stop. Uh, they can actually predict that kind of situations as well. So it's uh, doing pretty well. I'm going to show a video. This is a Google's Waymo. Google uh, has not released the newer videos. So this was a little bit old, but you can probably appreciate how that is working. I'm looking for volume switch, but uh, apparently... Apparently, uh, you only see the uh, no audio version of it. Uh, so Google Waymo is uh, demoing many, many places, and most people are comfortably uh, sitting inside, and they can maneuver pretty well. As I mentioned, Google is having about uh, 8 million vehicle miles traveled. And on top of that, what they do is uh, very interesting. So whenever cars are, are uh, in the automated mode, and there's a safety driver. In virtual world, they are doing billions of billions of miles. And this one can do faster than real time. So their algorithm is way advanced of other 
auto manufacturing, uh, doing the, the automated vehicles. Next one is a <laughs> close to the uh, Google. This is a GM Cruise. Uh, you will probably be amazed by how good they are driving in very tiny little uh, road stations. Like the here, there is like a, a, a stopping vehicle. <laughs> Ready is uh, maybe this slide can tell you a little bit, and then judgment is based on uh, your own. This is the data from Caltrans. Uh, Caltrans actually manages a license to drive uh, uh, automated vehicles. So maybe here Waymo, uh, GM Cruise, uh, Zoox, uh, Neuro, Pony.ai, Nissan, all these names, including Uber. Uh, they uh, get a license from uh, Caltrans. Caltrans is the California Department of Transportation. And in return, they, uh, they are reporting a uh, number of uh, disengagement, uh, or used to be called a takeover. So disengagement means that there's a safety driver and he or she thinks that I have to take over. So automated vehicles are being disengaged for a short term period. And then this bar is showing that uh, how many uh, uh, disengagement, uh, sorry, uh, how many miles they drive to get a disengagement? One disengagement. And Waymo is showing about uh, 0.09 disengagement per thousand miles. So this is like, uh, if you assume 0.1, uh, every 10,000 miles you have one disengagement. And I can confess that I probably have more than one oops situation during a year. I probably drive about 10,000 miles. So uh, this is actually doing better than me right now. Probably a lot of uh, uh, people, most of people. And next one is a GM Cruise. So this number is not uh, meaningful, but GM, uh, uh, GM is uh, doing better than any other company except for Google. Google was about two years ago at this level. So if you think of this as a maybe technology gap and Google is the number one and GM is about two years behind of developing technologies. And Uber, which had a crash, uh, person got killed in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. They had a 2,600 disengagement per thousand miles. So their technology is way, way uh, immature compared to uh, Waymo's. And if I have to bet on, uh, I probably bet on Waymo. Uh, you can probably buy a Google stock as well. Uh, it's probably a future based on Google uh, <coughs> for a for, for long time. So uh, it's, it's up to you that whether we'll see the, the fully uh, automated vehicles on the road. Uh, we are actually seeing them. Uh, Google actually put the, the, the taxi service without safety driver in a small area in Phoenix. Uh, so there's a no safety driver. Uh, there are many, many interesting challenges. How do we manage the license of these cars? I mean, should we have an a, a examination place and they come in and test them out? Uh, the challenge is obviously 
some of the algorithms are updated over the air. Uh, like a Tesla, uh, Tesla is uh, uh, having autopilot mode of uh, uh, autonomy, uh, automated vehicle uh, uh, capabilities, and they can update algorithm uh, over the air. So if they update over there, before they do, they should come and then take the test. Uh, they're very challenging. Uh, if I have to uh, speculate, what's going to happen is that uh, Volvo actually announced it uh, before they got sold to a Chinese company. Uh, Volvo announced it that we'll have liability of these uh, automated cars. If something happens, we'll cover with uh, uh, insurance. Uh, this could be a first step because uh, they can afford to buy expensive insurance uh, and then hopefully their cars sell more and they have a more profit and they can cover those. Uh, it's not easy to manage as a, a license plate method. Who knows? Uh, that's another big, big challenge in, in the near future. So, uh, Connected Cars program is uh, what U.S. Department of Transportation has uh, pushed for over probably almost 20 years. And they are actually uh, uh, supporting this uh, DSRC technology. Uh, now they have a new technology called the Cellular V2X, CV2X. So this is another interesting uh, uh, debate. Uh, uh, who's going to win is that uh, we are not sure. If you do know about GSM and CDMA in, in uh, telephone industry, yeah. uh, similar, uh, that actually coexisted for a while. And this might coexist, who knows. Uh, it may not coexist because they are using the same bandwidth. GSM, CDMA, they are using different bandwidth. Uh, so this may not coexist. So there have to, have to be ways of uh, 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 finding the, the winners for it. And it looks like it, European countries are going with the DSRC. China is going with the CV2X. US is going to be with the mix. So it's going to be interesting in the US. Uh, so again, as I said, uh, it's an unprecedented benefit through individual vehicular information. Now, we don't have to worry about collecting origins and destinations. Uh, every car, if they drive from home to their work, we actually get the OD with uh, every 100 millisecond updates of the locations and speeds and everything. So this is going to be interesting. Uh, we talked about the uh, importance of uh, calibration. We may not need to calibrate anymore. Uh, what happened in the air control industry, airplane control industry, they used to do a lot of research on calibrating their air traffic uh, maneuvers. Uh, with the fully automated air traffic control center, every airplane has a transponder. We can track real time where they are. They stop doing calibration. Instead, they actually have a two system. One the rear system, the other system mimicking rear system, copying basically. And then when they want to do something, they do some maneuver in the meter site. And then they just do predictions of the uh, airplane from where they are. And then they can actually update if they want to. And then do the other simulations. Uh, so that's basically much better than calibrating something. And we might have that in some near future. Uh, focus was obviously on safety, mobility, and environment impacts of the system. Uh, the safety was uh, uh, first shown uh, because uh, to get a support from Congress. Uh, and then if you want to get a bill approved, uh, Congress cares about safety more than mobility and economic impact. Uh, people actually die in the U.S. highways. Used to be about 40,000 per year. Now still 37,000, 34,000. It changed a little bit. So if we can actually improve that number, that's a huge for public. Uh, so safety is always the first for doing this connected vehicles. Uh, I'm going to just give you some ideas of uh, wireless communication technology, assuming this is not familiar with you guys. Uh, Wi-Fi you probably know. Uh, cellular, it's uh, uh, usually LTE level these days. And 5G, actually Korea actually first actually did it, 5G. Uh, they are fighting for 5G, and U.S. is actually almost ready to 
deployed in some small areas. And Bluetooth is a common, you probably know, Bluetooth headsets and then some of the mouse and those keyboards. RFID uh, used to have a really promising uh, opportunity. Uh, it has not, uh, uh, not taken off yet. Uh, so there is a way of, uh, a cheap way of recognizing devices. Uh, one of the uh, uh, well-known examples is uh, probably uh, in the back of your airport and you, pack, you put the RFID, you can probably know better than where your bags are. Right now, it's a very difficult. They only know when they scan them. Uh, DSIs we know, uh, CV2X I kind of mentioned. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit detail in these technologies. So Wi-Fi, uh, if you are a uh, tech person, you probably know that we now have an AC level, which is uh, using 5 gigahertz. So when you have a Wi-Fi router at home, it used to be a 2.4 gigahertz only. Now it also supports 5, so which you can have a higher throughput and you can actually two different networks at home and that's giving uh, huge bandwidth. And Wi-Fi has been around for since 1997. So DSRC actually comes from Wi-Fi. Uh, they wanted to have a, a proven technology instead of uh, developing something totally uh, new from scratch. Uh, so that's how you do. And Wi-Fi also support for a uh, uh, peer-to-peer ad hoc approach. And then typically routers are access points. Uh, radio, uh, cellular technology has evolved a lot. Uh, it's getting to the 5G, which will be a lot faster than Wi-Fi. Uh, so some people argue that we don't need the DSRC, which is based on Wi-Fi. Uh, this is the future uh, yet to see. Uh, I mean, Perspective of a uh, subject uh, expert, uh, people prefer to use a DSRC because it, uh, it's going to be free forever. And CV2X is actually started by Qualcomm's and, and Huawei companies. They don't want to lose a business in, in uh, car communications. They made a lot of money by having this cellular phone business and then it's moving into the auto manufacturers, cars, and then they want to have their own share. And that's they, how they pushed a lot on CV2X. So even though they say CV2X can actually provide a faster than DSRC capability, and in case there's no DSRC communication uh, connections, they can use a cellular. So they have a backup as well. Sounds more promising, uh, but they don't tell people is that it's going to cost money to users. Even though small amount, it's still cost for users. I'm not going to talk about 4G LTE in details. So the promise of the 5G is that uh, latency is as low as one millisecond, which is amazing. Right now, the DSRC is doing about uh, every 50 millisecond for control, another 50 millisecond for service channels. So it's about 100 millisecond latency or less. Uh, having one millisecond, uh, it's going to be huge, huge advantage. Especially if you are dealing with safety critical applications, uh, every millisecond counts. So maybe there is an opportunity uh, to improve. And then I'm not an expert in this area. And then someone tells me about even though you can communicate one millisecond, uh, other way of communicating uh, takes a longer time, so it's not going to be one millisecond latency. If you recall that when we had a 64-bit process of a CPU, CPU is a 64-bit, but all other buses are still 32. So CPU can do a lot faster computations until all other uh, accessories are upgraded. You don't get benefit. Uh, still, uh, there will be benefit later on, but this could be the situation at this point. Only this can do a one millisecond, all other even cars having CAN bus running, those takes about 200 milliseconds. Uh, if you want to do something to car, do something, uh, it takes time. Uh, so we'll see, but it has an uh, opportunity to improve. Uh, Bluetooth, uh, I don't have to tell you about. This is a well-known technology. Uh, it's a good thing is that uh, it, it's a, uh, relatively cheap, uh, but it's uh, not uh, for long distance. So it's only about probably 30 feet or 10 meters are very good. Uh, it can allow also ad hoc approach, and people do use uh, uh, Bluetooth for uh, communications. 
as well. Uh, RFID uh, used to be very well uh, known promising technologies. Uh, they have uh, passive ones and then they have also active ones. Uh, the passive ones are a lot cheaper, so you only actually get read when there is a reader sends something as a power and it's actually sort of a little bit charges and then do something and then send you back. Uh, so it's a passive one. Uh, again, you can use uh, for the tracking the bags at the airport and uh, library books and other things. If you have an active one, uh, it, it's a more expensive, but it can be also useful as well. Uh, this can be tracking expensive ones, like uh, cars in, in their, their uh, dealerships. They want to know where cars are, and they can easily get to know. Uh, and then the, the, one of the challenges of these uh, RFID or even the Wi-Fi is that they use the so-called MAC address, uh, medium access uh, address, uh, code, whatever that is, sorry. Mac, uh, so it's a unique div number given to each device and you can actually get exposed about where you are. And used to be the, the retailer shops are actually reading these uh, Mac addresses and once you actually sign up for their coupons, you are actually telling your Mac address pretty much. So they know who you are now and then you can, they can get targeted uh, advertisement because they know how many times you are coming back to the shop and how long they, you stay in the shop. Uh, so you lose a lot of privacy, uh, but in return you get a coupons. Uh, so you have to think about which is more valuable to you. Uh, maybe my privacy is not important. Uh, someone's privacy is very, very important. Uh, DSRC, I'm going to spend a little bit uh, more on this topic. So DSRC is uh, uh, evolved from uh, here 802.11a uh, technology, which is a 5 gigahertz. They wanted to have a higher bandwidth gigahertz because uh, higher the, the, uh, this band, you have a lower latency. It doesn't go far, but you can have a very low latencies. So instead of uh, 2.4 gigahertz, they want to operate at uh, 5.9 gigahertz. And Another challenge is that uh, different countries have a different spectrum allocated. Uh, it's one challenge. Uh, so it could be uh, two separate chips, or they could uh, solve this problem by software, but we'll have to see. Uh, and uh, this is a, a so-called uh, half duplex. Uh, you cannot uh, send and receive at the same time. So that's why they have a 50 millisecond of sending it and 50 millisecond of another channel sending it. And once you receive, you can send it back. Uh, it can do up to about uh, 300 meters uh, uh, reasonably well. Could go up to about 1,000 uh, meters about. And then the data rate is uh, uh, power based. So it could go up to 27 me uh, megabits per second. But most of the communications that we are doing with the DSRC is uh, text based. So I don't think we need to have uh, a high uh, data rate, because we are not sending videos, uh, we are not sending even pictures. Uh, so these are, are, are small packets. Uh, so it never is a two-way communications, even not the same time, but two-way communications, it will have a huge impact of changes. The, one of the major concerns is that uh, uh, supporting the ITS applications, so from 802.11a, 802, 802 uh, we made a P version, uh, for this transportation usage. And another IEEE uh, family of the, the standard defines uh, obviously the most important part is the security. So security is a, is a big concern for any communications. Uh, I don't think they figured out, but uh, it's getting there. So all the DSRC is using different level. Now new DSRC is a 5.9 gigahertz, at least in the US. This is the one I talked about. Uh, seven channels, I'm gonna show you more details. So there will be more applications than uh, other cases. You can consider this as like a radio channels. If you have a car, now do they have a radio channels? Oh good, okay, still. Uh, I thought the newer cars do not have any more. Uh, so the radio channels are from different multiple ones. You cannot listen them together. Impossible, right? So you have to tune one at a time. So these service channels are basically doing that. So you're allowed to listen to maybe 
traffic uh, management center, route, route guidance system type, traffic information channel, maybe entrepreneurship, getting coupons for maybe KFC, uh, uh, channels for providing maybe roadway uh, spots of the uh, uh, ice waters or, or whatever you want to do it. It, has, it can manage those with the multiple channels. Uh, so the, some comparison with the DSRC cellular, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi. Uh, most uh, important thing is probably the latency is uh, very, very low for DSRC. That's why they adopted the DSRC over other things. And you might ask why Wi-Fi is 1 to 5 seconds, DSRC is 0 0.2. Uh, even though DSRC comes from Wi-Fi technology. Uh, so one reason is that when you do Wi-Fi communications, you have to have an authentication process. Either you uh, log into the uh, 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 secure uh, connection and enter your user ID and password, or at least you have to give your you have to get an IP address assigned. So you send your MAC address, and they recognize you, and then you get the uh, MAC address. So you are now in the internet. They took it out. Uh, DSRC. They have no authentication process. Uh, the hope was that we want to have a quick communications. And now they are actually having concerns about security. Uh, so no authentication, you have a big concerns about security. Uh, CB2X is uh, uh, basically uh, using LT or 5G uh, connection that's allowing through the cellular network. So even though cellular network is uh, uh, very well deployed. There are some spots you don't get the signal. I know I couldn't get the signal here. Um, so, uh, but in general, it's a, it coverage is much better than Wi-Fi. So they, they argue that this cellular network, which will be evolving over time as well, will be backbone of uh, 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 redundancy. And then if they need to communicate, they still provide a direct uh, B2V, B2X communications. So it's becoming more like a DSRC and an additional feature of having a data cellular network, cellular data network. So that's their selling point. Uh, we'll see how it, go, how, how it goes. Uh, the PC5 interface and UU interface is basically using uh, DSRC and then data network. Uh, so they call it this as a communication device. So if you are nearby and you don't have to have a, a cellular network to convey your message, uh, so that's basically DSRC. And this is uh, when you have a long away, uh, you need to have a cellular network conveying your message through this uh, system. Uh, some of the history of US uh, connected vehicle is, uh, so this is a 1999. That's a very, very long time ago. In the US, there's a 911 call. They actually had a 511 calls. 511 call is for uh, transportation. If you have a situation of a traffic, you, are, you wanna know about uh, any events in the, uh, your state network, you call 511 and it goes into the Virginia, if I am in Virginia, and tells uh, about the situation of the traffic congestions and, and crashes which is good, but you have to dial up and then wait for the right moment to get the information. And they figured that with the technology evolving, they may want to have uh, wireless communication for this. So the FCC is uh, Federal Communications Commissions. They allocate bandwidth. They propose that, hey, we want to have uh, something like uh, 911 in, in transportation system for safety. They actually approved it and set aside this 75 megahertz bandwidth. If this band was uh, auctioned off to the cellular carriers, it could be uh, billions of dollars. So it's a huge uh, favor to a transportation community. And then they wanted to do the research with this one. They tried uh, many, many things. Uh, after almost uh, 14, 15 years later, in 2014, uh, USDOT, actually the NHTSA is the organization for uh, seeing safety administration. They made a recommendation that they want to have this technology be deployed. They made a recommendation to the Congress. Congress did not make a law yet. If they made a law in 2014-15, in uh, the hope was that within three years, 
every new cars will have this device equipped. Uh, and then we did not have to worry about competing with the CV2X uh, since they did not do anything. Uh, CV2X is uh, here. Uh, so Congress is, uh, USDOT is uh, waiting to see which one is going to be dominating. I don't know, you probably don't remember uh, the videotape called the VHS and then Sony Beta? You do? Okay. So that was a similar, uh, uh, similar uh, fight. Uh, I was told, uh, I'm not, I, I used to see beta, but so beta is a better technology, but it did not uh, succeed. Uh, the story I know is that a lot of companies actually use the VHS to produce videotapes. So Sony was the only one making a video movie with the beta tape and all others are using VHS. So people try to buy one that has a more uh, comparable to other uh, videotapes available. Uh, and then beta was slightly bigger than uh, VHS. Uh, the, the, the story about this uh, beta is a better technology is that before we actually convert it into digital, the, the broadcast companies are using Sony beta technology tape because it's a better quality than VHS. Uh, these are the actual devices that US DOT is uh, testing with. Uh, so FHW has a uh, uh, onboard equipment in their cars. And this is a, a communication device called the DSRC. Savari is one of the companies. Uh, is it here? The world seems to be Indian. Oh yeah, the, 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 the CEO is an Indian guy. Okay, yeah, yeah. I forgot his name, but he's an Indian guy, yes. Uh, and then CAPS is another company making these devices. And uh, the, the technology in this device, their CPU is so, so uh, powerful. And they can solve any uh, computational uh, heavy uh, optimization in a few seconds. Uh, used to be solving linear uh, mixed integer program is uh, taking a uh, very long time. And someone told me that they solved it within three seconds with this, this device. So they have very powerful. Uh, installing these is another uh, uh, efforts. Uh, again, I mentioned about having antenna heights and the locations are affecting the communication range. Uh, they also have a, a line of sight impact. If you have a good line of sight, you get better communications. If you have a trees or, or even uh, heavy trailer trucks blocking the line of sight, you don't get good uh, connections. So this is what I mentioned about uh, eliminating the authentication process. So Wi-Fi is using this uh, uh, receiver, client to receiver having authentication, and then, then they allow join the network. The SRC decide to take this out uh, to have a better, quicker, uh, communications, it kind of under making sense because cars are moving 60, 70 miles per hour. You don't have time to do these to avoid a crash. Uh, so that, that's uh, understandable. Uh, the way they communicate is uh, B2I, B2B, uh, all these connections uh, are available. Uh, control channels and service channels are, are one uh, thing you want to know. So they were designing these architecture, obviously, the protocols. They wanted to make sure that important message, uh, maybe safety critical message, should be delivered every opportunity they have. So they put that as a control channel. And control channel is happening every 50 millisecond. And then another 50 millisecond, they can use a service channel, as I mentioned. You can use uh, other uh, things. It could be a multimedia if you want. Uh, again, 50 milliseconds. I have this chart here. So this is a, a, a this is a CCH is a control channel, and this is happening every uh, 50 uh, every 50 millisecond. Another service channel, 50 millisecond service channel. So control channel is always guaranteed to communicate every 100 milliseconds. So that's sort of a minimum that if we wanna have uh, safety critical messages, avoid a crash uh, because of red light runners. And you can use this control channel to deliver them within 0.1 seconds. And you could argue 0.1 is too long, uh, probably not, uh, but it could be some point. 
Uh, at this point, it's not. So you can actually get the message and try to avoid the collisions. And others can be used any random or designated uh, needs. Hey, I'm going to use uh, this uh, control uh, service channel here and there and then so forth. So they can have uh, no interference between uh, service and control channels. Uh, again, same idea of uh, dividing these. Uh, one control and six service channels. That's why they have uh, seven channels. Uh, I think this is what I mentioned about better of a cellular versus DSRC. I'm ahead of my time, I guess. Uh, so beta and then VHS is an uh, analogy and which usually do not work very well anymore because people don't know. Uh, so I explain about this in detail and they understand uh, it will be happening. Uh, more likely, as I mentioned, China will use uh, CV2X. They don't have infrastructure for DSRC. Uh, uh, and then European actually decided they'll go with the DSRC. In the US, Ford announced that they'll do the CV2X. Uh, GM is doing the DSRC. So this is interesting. Uh, worst case, they might have uh, two devices and then two devices that turn it on and off. They cannot use both at the same time. Uh, so if, we, if you go to the Virginia, which is uh, maybe uh, CV2X state, now you have to use that one. Uh, funny. Uh, I'm going to spend some time on this one and then we'll stop in uh, five minutes. So next one is uh, applications. Uh, this has a lot of uh, information. Uh, safety, mobility, environment, and also some uh, CV test bed I'm going to uh, discuss. Obviously, the most important uh, aspect is the safety. Again, to sell this to the Congress, and uh, mobility and environment are important. And test beds are being uh, developed for assuring uh, environment that is not uh, uh, open to public and do a lot of uh, uh, rigorous testings. That's something you cannot do on, on, on the public road. So safety, uh, this is a, my view, and a lot of people agree on this. In the history of the transportation, the most important aspect of improving safety was probably a, a seat belt law. Uh, this was actually proven in the analysis of the crash data. Uh, there were certain cars had a much higher fatality rate than others, and it was not the car itself, uh, but uh, the mandate of the seat belts. So those actually wear seat belts actually have much less chance of getting killed. As you probably now know, without seat belt, you can actually go outside the window and get killed. So this was a huge uh, improvement in safety. Next one is probably airbag. By deploying airbag, we saved a lot of lives. And USDOT is hoping uh, this DSRC will be, become the dull, the big impact on improving safety. The idea is that when you communicate, uh, you can actually save on the perception reaction time. A lot of crashes happen uh, because drivers are not paying attention to it. So they are, uh, uh, their, their inattention is a causing problem when lead a vehicle or following vehicle is actually slowing down and then the, the ego vehicle is a forgot to slow down, continuously accelerate and they recognize and try to do something, you still need a perception reaction time and you get into crash, a rear end crash. So this uh, will allow have uh, getting information from the preceding vehicle, what it's doing and if needed you can just follow the same maneuver. If a uh, preceding vehicle is slowing down, I'm just slowing down without even uh, maneuver of the human drivers. Uh, as well as the humans are giving the, the uh, permission to do so. So that's what we are hoping. Uh, rail side is another interesting way of applications. <coughs> I'm going to skip this. Uh, and then crosswalk is a similar. A lot of crash happens uh, in the US on the crosswalk as well. And uh, having communication from the, the train side and also the vehicle side and they can probably avoid uh, this kind of collisions. Uh, this is a fairly low cost technology and even US is looking for without having DSRC are there ways of improving uh, uh, safety uh, avoid this kind of crash. One challenge is obviously the accuracy of GPS. How do we improve uh, uh, GPS accuracy is one, one other uh, interesting aspect of it. Uh, 
again, uh, we can use this for uh, grade crossing technology uh, similar to those. Uh, so basically, uh, alert drivers when it's safe to enter grade crossing or intersections. Uh, requires uh, uh, location uh, confirmation and, and understanding the train or other uh, heavy vehicles approaching and, and try to avoid them. Uh, sometimes uh, accuracy is uh, uh, not good enough for current technology. This was uh, uh, GPS based technology and this is in the Manhattan area. They are doing a connected vehicle pilot test and they're trying to uh, provide information about these routes and actual GPS is showing these locations. Mm -hmm. uh, so the road is like this. So they decided to try out ultra wideband technology. Ultra wideband is uh, up to about 20 gigahertz. Uh, even 5G can actually do that. When you actually send the signal, they are moving at almost uh, optical speed, right? Uh, then they can go and then come back. So they know exact uh, distance between the two uh, objects. So they can actually have a much more accurate location by having one pixel location nearby. So you have one infrastructure in location, you can actually get the exact distance, another distance. You can triangulate to know where they are. Uh, that's how I actually demonstrated it. And they even did this in, inside a tunnel. So inside a tunnel, you don't get GPS, and so-called data reckoning is not always uh, accurate. So they use this ultra wideband technology to know where buses are and try to have a better uh, operations. Uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, to support the automated vehicles, obviously DSRC is good, uh, ultra wideband is uh, doing a lot better accuracy, as I mentioned about tunnels and even indoors, uh, and a lot of map messages for later alignment and work zones. The one of the challenges about work zones is that it's changing so rapidly. Even though the contractor actually said, submit, uh, we're going to have a work zone layout like this. And then rarely they actually uh, do that. They change even operation hours. They say we're going to do uh, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. They do different hours. Uh, they have a layout. Uh, as the uh, workers are doing it, they don't obey that. Uh, so having this uh, uh, maybe RFIDs and other devices, they can have a better real-time data. Oh, could it be a LIDAR? LIDAR could actually have done that as well. Uh, so that's probably a good idea. Uh, Near-term CV only corridors can be used. Uh, one of the ideas is uh, market penetration rate is not going to be very rapidly increasing. Uh, as I mentioned, about 3% uh, of cars are new vehicles every year. So it's not going to be very fast. Uh, so they are thinking about having a little bit of aftermarket and that they use as a dedicated lane uh, for the uh, connected and automated vehicles, uh, just like uh, HOV or HOT lanes. Uh, and with the CV, you don't need a toll tax anymore. Uh, it's so-called open, open toll. Uh, you can actually charge anytime, anywhere you want to do. Again, that's a challenge with the big brother issue and privacy issues as well. Um, I'm going to stop here and we come back at maybe 3.15. Uh, any questions or comments? This is a too much future and not interested in. Whether you like it or not, it's coming. Yes. Sir, uh, what will be the role of a uh, dark food engineer in uh, making a uh, fully automated car? What is the role of a traffic engineer making fully automated cars? Yes. Uh, we are more of an infrastructure aspect of it. Uh, and we are also in charge of uh, control devices, and they need us to figure it out, how to make it work together. Uh, you could actually, okay, are, is this being recorded? <laughs> Hope not. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, my opinion is that traffic engineer, we cannot be better than the uh, computer scientists doing automated vehicle and AI technique. But they don't know the traffic. I can give you one example. Uh, they want to provide uh, the guidance of Oops. micro stop stopped working. Done for 
advisories or warnings. And we actually do have a control on vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure controls. Uh, so this could be a way of improving safety. Uh, obviously, the first thing is uh, uh, providing awareness where the cars are, what the danger, dangers are, so people can actually try to avoid, especially the roadway uh, uh, icy situations. Uh, providing that, that information can help to slow down. Uh, and the key, another key is uh, uh, eliminating crashes by utilizing B2B and B2I. This is one promising technology. If you have a red light, red light running case, and hopefully you know which one is uh, uh, doing the red light uh, running, and then another car is approaching, just give a, a guidance uh, to, to avoid a crash. Uh, communication is uh, important. How do you utilize these? Again, the challenge is uh, the accuracy of the positioning. Current GPS is not even telling you which lane you are at, unfortunately. Uh, maybe better GPS technology. And uh, some people actually are, are very optimistic about having high definition uh, 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 map uh, that actually can uh, point out where you are by even using uh, cameras. So you have such a high resolution a digital map that your positioning camera can tell based on this image you are definitely in this location. Uh, that might help. So whatever the, the technology can evolve, uh, having better positioning is a almost a must for avoiding crash. And then uh, this message of here I am. So idea is that there might be two-way communications of a DSRC or there might be just a simply sending one way uh, here I am only message. That might be useful for knowing where the cars are and, and what information you have. Um, and, and again, with the 5G technology, if you have one millisecond latency, you don't need a DSRC and, and your cellular phone can do everything for you uh, by putting that into your car. Uh, but to improve safety, communication is a, a one important aspect uh, of uh, improving safety. These are a lot of demos. And I'm not going to show every single demo today. Uh, this is a kind of old video, uh, so it may not be very fancy, but this is, let's look at this video. Uh, emergency electric uh, brake lights. Uh, so they have this uh, vehicles are coming in. Uh, they get to see something. See something in there uh, was actually telling that a uh, car ahead of it is actually braking. Uh, obviously, the best option is that uh, the car recognizes that and then does it automatically for you because having perception reaction time is going to take a long time. And this is a blind spot. Uh, this actually uh, helps a lot of uh, situations because uh, when you you have a situation of uh, cars very close and you cannot even recognize cars next to you, uh, things like that. Uh, so this is a, uh, obviously a demo done in early 2000. Uh, as you can see, video is not uh, really uh, good quality, and then devices are uh, fairly uh, premature. Uh, but it helps uh, to just demonstrate those. And this fold uh, collision warning is uh, pretty much every car these days, new cars. And, and I don't know, have you experienced this uh, collision, warning? collision warning? I feel that this is uh, OK. Uh, Probably 90% of the time, I don't need it. Just giving the warning to me. And once in a while, I, I thank that technology, which I was not paying attention to it. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, for safety, so basically, uh, we're getting uh, infrastructure information as well. And it can provide information of uh, uh, potential uh, dangerous situations. And again, it could be a warning <laughs> or advisories to the equipped vehicles. Uh, these are all different application that has been sort of proposed and being tested and developed. So a lot of research has been going on under the Federal Highway Administration's uh, funded research area. And uh, anything relevant to what you are doing, I guess? Uh, some people talked about uh, dynamic all red and clearance time of these. So I am personally against of doing this, uh, in, in part because people will know 
this interaction it will continuously extend the all weather time to avoid the crash. So that often encourages people to continuously accelerate even you are seeing beginning of red. I mean, people actually do violate uh, not on purpose. You are seeing yellow and you think you can make it and then while doing it and it became red and you know it's too late to apply brake. You cannot stop before the stop bar. Uh, that's bad enough and then this will allow people continuously accelerating even they see the red as long as they are in the intersection it will probably extend the old red time. Uh, so I'm personally not uh, in favor of doing that uh, but I am in favor of doing the yellow time adjustment for those who need a longer uh, response time. So we will probably know this person maybe uh, a person is uh, 85 years old or, or his perception time is longer than typical young drivers, so we probably want to have extended time. Uh, that I am okay. Uh, so, that kind of thing. Uh, CCAS uh, V is a collision avoidance system for uh, intersection. Uh, they, they have information from the uh, infrastructure and telling uh, if there's a, a red light uh, runners and to avoid a clash, uh, maybe even if, if, it's, if it's showing green, you can probably want to stop. Uh, things like that can happen. Uh, the gap assistance is another challenging. Uh, this is kind of interesting. When person is just sitting at the uh, permissive right turn uh, lane and people wait longer, they actually accept the shorter gap. If you are at the beginning of the first minute, uh, you probably want to take uh, uh, your time to accept maybe I need about four seconds of gap. Uh, but if you wait three minutes, you're actually going into the intersection and I'm eager to wait, get, take a gap even 2.5 seconds or even less. Uh, so this will actually assure that this is adequate gap for you to make a turn kind of thing. Uh, this is actually a demo, but it's probably not. CCAS-V applications enable vehicles to communicate with traffic signal controllers. In this scenario, CCAS-V provides visual and audible warnings. The blue visual icon appears approximately 250 meters away from an intersection. The red warning icon appears if a light is red, or about to turn red, and the vehicle shows no signs of braking. At the same time, an audible warning is heard, Stop light. alerting the driver of a potential accident, allowing sufficient time for the driver to brake. So this was a sort of a concept uh, of idea, and if you actually do it, uh, it should be a lot better than this kind of interface. Uh, emergency vehicle preemption is a well-known technology, and it truly saves uh, people and lives. Uh, but the SPED data is the key. It's called the uh, signal phase and timing data. So SPED data is uh, something that controller has uh, displaying currently right now. So it's uh, telling which one is just getting green. And in case it's uh, pre-timed, uh, in case it's getting max screen or, or knowing about the gap out times, they can probably tell this is getting into the gap out uh, with the I'm about to gap out and things like that. So as a, as a detailed information is possible to provide that to other vehicles to take advantage. And emergency vehicle preemption cases that they can actually do this way in advance of the intersections. Right now, this is done by each intersection and it sends a signal, give me the green, and then they just give a green whenever it's possible. And often it's good, but uh, sometimes it's not uh, optimal for other vehicles at the intersections. But if you have these multiple communication based, you can actually continuously provide a green band. And even better with the estimating uh, vehicle ahead of it, and you can clear those vehicles uh, when you need to clear them for emergency vehicle preemption. Uh, maybe traffic light preemption.
curve speed warning is another interesting area. Once you know the, the, the geometry conditions where you are, you can definitely give this kind of warnings. Uh, a lot of uh, 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 single vehicle uh, off the runoff road crash happens with the curve and you're not paying attention to it. Let's keep going. Uh, railroad crossing is a lot of the dangerous places and you can actually have uh, where trains are coming in, having communications, and making sure that uh, they stop before the stop bar at the, the gate. Uh, that's important as well. Um, spot weather impact warnings. A lot of cases, the road has uh, uh, icy situations, and if you can recognize those, uh, this will be useful for uh, improving safety. Uh, work zone. Uh, Warning is uh, sometimes uh, this is more of a compliance to me. Uh, people do not just slow down at the work zone unless they have to because of uh, police around or too many cars, you cannot go uh, fast. Uh, but the work zone is uh, people work there and it's a dangerous location. It's better to have uh, uh, complying with the speeds and, and improving safety. A lot of uh, priority applications that USDOT identifies is obviously uh, uh, based on the number of crashes and, and fatality rates. Uh, red light violations are one of the key challenges uh, because of this is going high speed and creating uh, severe injuries and, and fatalities. And a lot of the uh, runoff road, the, the highest, one of the highest number of crashes is uh, happening on two-lane uh, rural highways, and it's uh, usually runoff road. People get sleepy, and then they just go off the road, so especially in the curve area, so that's another high priority area. And then people are not comfortable making the uh, permissive turns or stop uh, intersections, and then providing that is also important. Next is uh, mobility. So, some people do not believe in uh, safety improvements a lot uh, because uh, crashes are happening because of a uh, person's uh, inattention reason. So connected vehicle is uh, providing maybe supplementary guidance. Uh, if we need to have uh, automated vehicles, uh, then it's a uh, true benefit for safety because an automated vehicle can avoid perception reaction time of human drivers. Uh, not to mention inattention time. Unless the sensors are not working, their uh, perception reaction time is almost the minimum. Uh, radar sensor has a latency of about 20 millisecond or less, uh, which is nothing compared to human drivers. Even human is well alerted, human needs about 0.5 or 6 seconds to perceive something. So that's a long distance you travel if during 0.5 or 6 seconds and it gets worse if you're not paying attention to it. Uh, so connected vehicle might be giving warnings and you still need a 0.56 second uh, perception time to react. So automation is probably the key to improve. Uh, connected vehicle is uh, supplementing it. Uh, automated vehicle with the connectivity can be more synergetic effect. Uh, mobility wise, uh, connected vehicle has a huge advantage. Uh, you get the abundant amount of data from this technology and then this real-time data can be used for many many things. Uh, a lot of applications, we'll talk about it later, but uh, speed harmonization is one of the key technology application that people are talking about. Uh, obviously, uh, this uh, speed harmonization, also known as a variable speed limit, uh, which requires a compliance. Uh, here again, the automated vehicle comes in. If automated vehicles are in there, about 30% of the cars, if they obey the speed, think about it, a third of the cars are, are complying with the speed, it's very difficult to weave through and then speeding. So you are forced to comply with the speed limit or variable speed limit, and it works very well. So. Uh, to do this, uh, the most important uh, research is uh, data capture and management, so-called the DCM. Uh, used to be we don't have enough data to do something. Now we have too many data. How do we manage this data in real time? Uh, what data we want to capture? And then DMA is a dynamic mobility applications. Uh, there's a, a bunch of data uh, 
uh, based applications that DOT actually developed based on bottom-up approach instead of a top-down. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, AIM is a, a very well uh, researched area, interestingly enough. Uh, AIM means that at the intersection, you don't use a traffic light and cars are being uh, fly through uh, and then and has huge efficiency. And another area is uh, the freeway merge that people are not comfortable, especially you don't have uh, uh, auxiliary lane, uh, enough auxiliary lane, it's very difficult to merge in and then this technology might help. So uh, a lot of the uh, mobility applications are based on arterial freeway and corridor levels and requires all these kind of data and we have uh, many, many applications. Uh, we'll probably talk about that. Uh, DCM is, uh, uh, again, same idea, uh, too much data and how do we capture them properly and how do we process them in real time for improving mobilities. Uh, so this has been interesting research. Again, this has to be uh, depending on the applications. Uh, so one point, an idea that people talked about was, so we get the raw data of uh, every 100 milliseconds and then this is getting processed by maybe RSE, roadside equipment, and it's being given to the maybe safety critical applications almost the real time. And if you need to give uh, uh, echo driving type, that's uh, basically not every 100 milliseconds, you can do a few seconds. Uh, if you are providing uh, travel guidance for network information, that's even for more, uh, even 10 seconds or five seconds. So we might have a hierarchy of those applications and how do we process the data to have a maximum efficiency. Uh, again, also the data is needed for future research, so how do we archive them is another challenge. I, I downloaded about a month worth of uh, data from uh, Michigan's uh, safety pilot study. It's uh, uh, carrying about 8,000 vehicles and moving around whenever they are moving around. So this was not 24-7 operations. This was given to state employees and volunteers and, and those who actually drive longer distances. And they got this device and when they drive this data, every uh, 100 millisecond data is being disseminated. And then 48 locations of uh, roadside equipment is uh, taking this data and archive them. Uh, month worth of data was over 200 gigabytes. Uh, even downloading was a challenge. Uh, I mean, not a speed. Uh, my Mac was using different format and I could not even uh, uh, unzip them. Uh, so it's a long story, but uh, so how do we manage this data and then making it uh, available to researchers is a very important topic. So they have a nice metadata uh, telling what data it, it contains and what it can be used is very important. Uh, obviously, we do use a, a cloud for these. And then in case there's more data and updates and how do you make sure that these are compatible to be used uh, is another challenge as well. And then who's going to manage and then uh, make it available. A lot of data, probe data, trip data, weather data can be collected and uh, putting this into a context. So people might be interested in uh, knowing about these uh, uh, prove the, the safety pilot uh, DSIC data uh, wanted to see the impact with the, the weather conditions, wanted to see the impacts of uh, safety number of crashes, so-called hotspots. Uh, one interesting research one could have done is uh, the crash data is a sort of a, a behind uh, schedule in releasing it. In the U.S., actual crash data is released after 12 to 18 months. Uh, so if the crash hotspot is changing over time, you don't really have uh, real-time data to update. Uh, maybe we use this uh, uh, safety pilot real-time data to see uh, if there's any unnecessarily unrealistic deceleration, which indicates uh, a crash or near-miss crashes. And more of those data is uh, in certain areas that are probably very likely to have crashes compared to others. And we compare that with the historical crash data. And if it shows high correlation. Maybe we use those data to check which spot is going to be uh, something we have to look into to improve safety instead of waiting a year or a year and a half. Uh, could it be done? So combining this data is important as well. 
Uh, this was a data set that's available. So if you go to this website, I think you have to register. Uh, you can register and then get uh, tons of data available uh, for research if you are interested in. Um, uh, I mentioned about DMA. So this was a, a idea coming from the, the stakeholders. So what they have done was uh, asking any stakeholders what is uh, your needed application or potential application that can improve mobility area. And they got 93 ideas and they selected uh, 26 applications and these are bundled into six applications. So let me give you one example. Maybe MMITS is uh, doing uh, echo driving, uh, freight signal priority, uh, transit signal priority, uh, some sort of uh, other pedestrian signal priority, uh, preemptions and other things. So this is all related to the arterial environment. So this is an MMITS. Inflow is a mostly freeway related. You could have uh, uh, speed harmonizations or cooperative electric cruise control systems, queue warnings and ramp meterings and things like that. So they are uh, creating many, many applications, in this case, 26 of them, and then put, in to, put them together into the sort of a groups as a vendors. So you are doing it for arterials, freeways, and corridor levels, and regional levels, and they are trying to do this, uh, somewhat even for transit systems as well. Uh, so DMA is uh, doing uh, optimal way of uh, uh, traffic and, and transportation operations, and, and also, the multimodal uh, intersect uh, modes of transportation is uh, seamlessly connected. Uh, some of our ideas is that maybe we want to have a bus, uh, they, they have uh, uh, transfer locations, and if this is a uh, major uh, uh, regional connection bus, and if uh, the, another bus is coming into and then getting into the, the major intercity bus, and they can probably co provide a communication that, hey, I have a five passengers that need to get on. Uh, we are behind the schedule. Can you wait another five minutes instead of just leaving in four minutes? Uh, something that can be happen to improve. Uh, also, uh, connecting with uh, uh, metro systems, park and rider systems. Uh, it's important in the US, even though if you want to use a park and ride and metro, you have uh, no information if there is an available parking spot at the metro station. Uh, you need to take a risk and you go and there's no parking spot available, you are behind the 20 minutes. Uh, so that kind of thing as uh, information, communications and sharing of those is important. I'm not going to go every single detail on this one, uh, but DMA vendors are doing inflow, MITS, uh, Fratis, uh, this is freight and intersections, the freeways, also traffic management. Rescue me, me is also emergency management applications and also transits. So T-Connect is the concept I mentioned. T-Connect will allow that uh, schedule behind of a bus, uh, they can wait another minute or two if they can connect them, uh, they provide the, the, that kind of information. Also uh, dynamic transit operations are an interesting concept. Uh, sometimes you have uh, uh, unexpected higher demand coming in, maybe you want to adjust your headway. Used to be every 20 minutes, if you can change to 15 minutes, uh, then problem is that unless this information is given to every possible uh, users, uh, someone will actually miss a bus they are waiting for. So they actually have a bus on the uh, uh, web or their app. Uh, every bus has now GPS anyway, so they know where buses are and they are telling them alert. Uh, and this is more interesting. Uh, if you are actually using a certain route guidance app and it wants to connect with your Google Calendar or your Facebook events, so it actually considers your destination to the activity. And this is about 10 miles away and it's telling you that you have to be leave now and this is your alternative option of uh, taking transit instead of uh, driving. Uh, it's possible. So this communication technology and information technology can actually improve the uh, operations. Uh, speed harmonization, as I mentioned, is part of uh, highway operations. Whole idea is that when you have a, a downstream bottleneck, if everybody travels at the uh, same uh, high speed, more people waiting at the downstream, creating queue, 
and creating shockwave and getting things are worse. So the whole idea is uh, when there's a downstream bottleneck and we know how long it's going to take in terms of uh, bottleneck that can be uh, uh, reserved because of uh, stopped vehicles and others. And then we try to have a upstream vehicles moving slowly to join the queue because a join the queue will have a shock wave and taking longer to recover to the, the normal flow conditions. If you slow down and then join normal flow, it's a lot better situations. Uh, so <laughs> in, in case of, uh, uh, I heard the Germany, if there is a crash happens on the two lane highway, they actually deploy huge trucks uh, and then force them to follow at the slower speed, uh, so-called the pace cars. Uh, that actually helps the, to avoid additional congestions. So this uh, speed amortization, uh, if we can uh, improve the, the co compliance of the vehicles, as I mentioned, the automated vehicle doing uh, exactly complying those actually helps to improve. Uh, this is the idea of doing that. I'm not going to explain in detail. Uh, this is one video showing uh, sort of speed amortization. Uh, so this is showing 55 now. Bottom is uh, uh, not having speed harmonization. So we are in 50. So we actually have them to comply, and then they don't have a, a lot of congestions. Uh, if you don't have anything, you get a lot of congestion. And here, you actually change the speed based on the situation of the uh, freeway. Uh, obviously, this is showing that uh, depending on the number of cars, you're trying to have a vehicle emerging a uh, better way. A lot of efforts can be made. If you are, if you are rightmost, uh, you actually have them to move left. In your case, if you are leftmost, you have them move to right, and that have allowed a better uh, more situations. So your speeds are getting smaller and smaller, but it's not, not creating this uh, almost uh, queuing and jamming situations. You can avoid that. So it's a possibility uh, to improve. Again, compliance is uh, a key issue. Have uh, uh, large benefits uh, by doing this in the simulation basis. Uh, CACC is another very promising technology. Uh, if I just give you a very simple calculation, uh, in the US, they actually demonstrated that CACC can have as a small as a 0.6 seconds of a time headway between the vehicles. They actually demo in the field. You saw the video, one of those. And in real world, if I'm driving, I'm probably comfortable having one point some seconds. Let's say I'm comfortable with 1.8 seconds high speed. So this will actually create three times more throughput on the same lane without changing anything infrastructure. So it's a very, very promising. Uh, so a lot of people are trying to do, have a research in this area. Uh, without CACC, is a lot of the uh, unstable braking maneuvers. People are just doing their own I'm getting close and, and I'm going to slow down too much. I am far away. I'm going to accelerate. And then following cars don't care. I don't want to accelerate. I want to maintain huge spacing. So you don't have efficiency. Uh, when you have a CACC enabled, this is a creating uh, pretty much a platoon or train of vehicles. So they communicate each other. They accelerate together. They decelerate together. Uh, has of a great potential to improve. This was pretty much the same video, but this was done by PATH program. Uh, this is a real freeway, though. Uh, they are doing the CACC demo. Uh, leader vehicle it accelerates about 0.1 G, and everybody follows. Uh, and they maintain about 0.6 seconds of gap, and leader vehicle decelerates. Everybody is doing it at the same time. I want to see it again. Sorry. So it's a latency of 0.1 seconds, or 100 milliseconds, you want to call it. So it's doing almost the same time, uh, which will have a lot better advantage as well. Uh, so this is a very, very promising. Obviously, uh, are we getting, going to get 100% uh, connected and automated vehicles in the year soon? Uh, a lot of people expect that this will happen on the dedicated lane first, uh, with the majority of the cars are doing it. At least we have a one whole corridor that providing huge throughput for the system. Autonomous intersection is uh, very, very promising and interesting. The whole idea of this one is that uh, this was uh, the IEEE uh, control magazine 
And they were actually showing that why humans are not able to do this kind of a maneuver. And the short answer was, uh, uh, fish does not have an ego. Uh, <laughs> human does. So human thinks that I am better than you. Uh, so that's uh, one reason. So here, wh wh when we want to do this, we have to take out ego. So everybody is controlled by central system, and they use the so-called reservation system. So they reserve roadway spot, and then no, uh, at, at, at a given time, there's only one vehicle existence. So they avoid the collisions. So this is a, a video of those animations. So this is the intersection without having any signal control. And every vehicle has a reserve, reserve the roadway trajectory. And then at any given time, that no vehicles are overlapping each other. And you could have some bigger buffers as well. But this, this works beautifully, uh, simulation. And real world is a, another challenge. Uh, we have a communication latency, uh, things like that. So we'll see. Uh, so this uh, shows a huge advantage, obviously, I'm not going to mention. Uh, another one is a free merge assistance. So when, when this uh, auxiliary lane is a very uh, short, it's a very challenging situation. And in the U.S., a lot of places, you don't have a really long auxiliary lane. So you're going in, you almost have to stop to make a merge. And it's the best option is having longer one, and then they have a uh, continuously accelerate and try to find a gap. Or uh, we have a sort of advisory that there's a, a on ramp coming up, and you guys move to the left lane, and then making a gap available, or try to avoid way of improving this uh, is a calculating trajectory and then provide the guidance. So this is the research. Uh, so the vehicles are coming in, and this I think the bottom one is a controlled one looks better. This one is not controlled, so they don't change things and they try to merge later. Here we actually have a green cars coming in and we either actually allow them to go the other side uh, or uh, predict the sort of trajectory and then provide uh, the best trajectory to merge into it uh, kind of thing. It's almost time, I guess. Uh, so mobility, uh, mobility impact has a benefit of uh, increased uh, throughput delays and then speed as well, which is good. Uh, another one is the environmental aspects of it. Uh, so people are concerned about sustainable transportation and how to make a green choices, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, application for environment, real-time information synthesis, so-called areas. And it combines with uh, weather uh, uh, applications as well. Uh, some of the idea is obviously uh, uh, using real-time data and try to improve uh, uh, environment. Uh, I'll have some other uh, examples. So one of the examples that people actually found out is that route guidance system. Uh, so they define echo uh, guidance, route guidance. It, they realize that even though you travel longer distance, if your speeds are, are better and your fuel consumption is less, and sometimes a longer distance could have a shorter travel time as well. Uh, a lot of fuel consumption happens, uh, you have stop and go conditions and uh, taking longer time and things like that. So this abundant amount of data can give you real time data and we can probably guide them to certain routes which might be uh, longer distance by providing even shorter travel time and better speed to maintain uh, environment is sustainable. Uh, less emissions and, and fuels, uh, things like that. So they have a, a couple of applications to go with it. Uh, echo signal is obviously well known. Uh, the idea behind this is uh, uh, we know the beginning of green and where you are. And if you know you cannot get through the intersection, there's no reason to speed up and then wait longer time. I mean, this is a human behavior. Human sees that it's about to change yellow, and I know there's no need to speed up. They just cruise, which is causing problem as well, but uh, that's a human behaviors. And if we know that uh, we are cruising, and if we can speed up a little bit, and then we can make it to the green, then it's probably a good idea to have them. Uh, another echo driving is uh, you actually uh, accelerate once and then cruise. So you have a much less fuel consumption than acceleration, deceleration, acceleration, deceleration, things like that. Uh, dynamic echo lanes for similar purpose. Echo travel is what I just talked about. Uh, low emission zones uh, try to have uh, 
uh, better speeds. So this was a, something that uh, Netherlands people found out that optimal operation uh, mobility is not equivalent to optimal emissions. So sometimes the emissions are, are, are less with a slightly lower speed than very high speed, uh, things like that. Uh, so these are some examples of these environmental applications. So again, they actually put together these uh, bundles into uh, different applications. We saw this about echo signals and others. Uh, so this is uh, another way of looking at the uh, bottom-up approach of having many ideas and trying to put together bundles so that they can have a synergy effect and also this is something implementable. Uh, again, this is uh, echo signal operations. Uh, signal side of it is uh, doing echo approach and departures. Uh, signal timing could be uh, echo friendly. Uh, this is uh, another way of uh, having adaptive signal control. If you have a low volume conditions and Right now in the US, at least the major street is just keeping green all the time. Uh, so that chance of getting whichever cars are coming, it's probably likely major street. Now you don't have to do that. You can actually dynamically adjust the those, uh, even for a freight signal priority. Uh, if the freights are, are taking longer time to start, maybe we give a heads up uh, to avoid the start or loss time. Dynamic echo lanes, we talked about it, uh, a lot of echo lanes. Uh, low emission zones, uh, we talked about as well. Uh, so we actually try to maintain this a certain uh, air quality concerned area, try to avoid additional emissions are, are being uh, disseminated in that area. Uh, possibly having some pricings as well. And providing multimodal so that we have less number of uh, uh, emitting vehicles. Uh, you probably know the interesting study that when a bus actually carrying uh, one or two uh, passengers, it's a much, much worse than uh, two passenger or five passenger cars. Uh, <laughs> so you have to make sure that bus are filled with uh, passengers to take advantage of those. Um, again, I mentioned about Echo Traveler, a lot of interesting echo routing ideas, uh, transit routing, freight routing, and things like that. Also, they are doing the alternative fuel vehicle operations. Uh, obviously, electric cars and hybrid cars are very efficient, except for the source of their uh, power, electricity, uh, has to be coming from sustainable sources. Uh, if you use a, a, a coal-based uh, plant or, or uh, oil-based plant, then it's not very sustainable at all. Um, and then. The one good thing about electric cars is that if they go downhill, they actually can capture the, the electricity. They actually generate the power. Uh, so sometimes your power is uh, almost uh, uh, forever, uh, almost forever. And also a lot of the hybrid cars, uh, if you can charge at home, they don't even have to use the, the uh, gas for most of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, they actually provide up to probably 30 miles uh, with the electricity. Then if your commute is less than 10 miles, you never need to use uh, gas. So you don't even fill the gas for a month or unless you are going to be out of town. So hybrid is somewhat very efficient as well. Um, uh, echo approach and departure is the same idea. Uh, SPED data is going to be available in many locations. So SPED data starts from showing what is displaying right now. And hopefully with the algorithms and when it's going to turn into yellow and uh, things like that. Um, so this is one example of doing that, I think. <coughs> Maybe it's not. So you have uh, <laughs> speed. And you have RPMs showing, and signals are not showing up here. But um, so you have acceleration scenario doing it. Uh, so it must be green indications. So you can just get through. It's green there. Uh, so if you know this, if this is a curve data. You don't see the signal, but SPED data will ensure you that uh, this is yellows and and, and so forth. 
and then red, and you can stop. Uh, doing so has a huge advantage in fuel consumption, depends on speeds and others, uh, but average improvement is uh, fairly large. Uh, road weather is also important aspects. Uh, we collect the data. The problem with the road weather is that uh, the stations, road weather stations are not many. They are usually near airports, and there are many people that you do at home, but they are not accurate. Uh, what we need is uh, roadway uh, condition, not the uh, weather of entire area. Uh, so that's another interesting challenge to make sure that we get the uh, roadway surface data, especially uh, snow conditions. Even uh, rain with uh, uh, standing water situations are very dangerous. So how do we recognize this is going to be another challenge as well. Uh, Claris is the term they used to manage this kind of system. Uh, People also recognize that uh, with the inclement weather, people are not speeding as fast as they used to be. So they are trying to adjust the offsets based on uh, inclement weather conditions. And the modeling those situations is also affecting the performance as well. Uh, this is probably the most important or interesting part for you. Uh, we're almost there. Probably the MCD is probably the most important uh, idea that, that I can share. So when they started this uh, connected vehicle, they need to have a test bed. Uh, try to demonstrate California was a leader with the path and then doing a lot of uh, signal related and freeway systems. Virginia was also doing the smart road at, at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, which is a sort of a real road about ready to use for public. Like they left about half mile each as a not constructed yet. So they have a, almost a mile and a half location. They create the snows and forks and others. They test the different pavement conditions and they do a lot of connected vehicle testing as well. And then some point the MCD came up. I'm going to show that MCD here. So this is a part of the University of Michigan uh, initiative. Michigan is known for the uh, auto manufacturers. Uh, there are Ford, the GM headquarters are there. Not made, I don't know headquarters, but the, they are huge manufacturer. Ferocity is there. Uh, and they wanted to actually revive this uh, uh, car industry, auto industry. And they decided to create this. You can see here, this is more like the uh, movie theater set. It's not a real building. It's just showing the big, big panel with the uh, uh, face of the uh, movie theater. Let me just show you this. M-City is a public-private partnership aimed squarely at transforming mobility through connected and automated technology. We have a Lincoln MKZ that we converted as an open autonomous vehicle test platform. In the demo, another vehicle will run red light and the MKZ will detect and sense the danger and stop safely. So this is a real world event. We demonstrate yeah, something we call we'll connected come. automated forward collision avoidance. When the another vehicle is again. hiding behind the curve and a human reacts to it when it sees the vehicle, it requires a really hard braking and that would be dangerous in scenarios when the road surface is wet uh, or icy. We show how a connected automated vehicle reacts to such a scenario. It is able to see it through the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity. Sensors would not be able to detect and evaluate track. We have the MCD test track to help test and evaluate so technology. Basically, we are However, we only have limitations. You can only build so many scenarios to do the, the test. This was a problem from the get-go. We were trying to solve this problem, safe, but it's not and eventually we'll come up with the, with the idea of augmented reality, 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 reality so that this can enhance the capability of a closed test track. We combine simulated world with real testing track. The Michigan Traffic Lab is also the control center for MCD, so it connects perfectly to all of the control devices within MCD. So what we have is a parallel simulation which generates virtual vehicles. So this is a way to use augmented reality technology to help to test connected and automated vehicles safely and more efficiently. While we always need on-road testing of these uh, Should be ready for real world fairly soon. Uh, that's a pretty much it. These are just not.
very interesting. Uh, a lot of other places have one, but not like what they have there. So uh, this is my email address if you need to contact me. Uh, I know it's a little bit uh, over time, but if you have any questions, What do you mean homogeneous? Oh, 